Hi you guys and welcome back to another makeup and true crime video. I have been loving making these videos for you guys but it takes like hours and hours and hours of research. So if you really enjoy these videos I would love it if you could hit the like button down below. Go do it. it takes like a second. And please subscribe so I know that you want me to keep making this content. It would really help me out and I would love you to join the fam. So today's case is another Australian case and this one really made a huge impact in Australia and it really shocked the nation. It exposed major flaws in the criminal justice system, especially in the parole system, and it really did cause public outrage. So let's just get into the story. So this is the case of Jill Marr. Jill Marr was born Gillian McKeon on 30th October 1982 in Drogheda, Ireland. Correct me if I'm wrong. She was 29 years old in 2012 when this case took place. She spent her early childhood in Ireland and her family relocated to Australia when her father got a job in Perth. And they lived in Perth for a while before they moved back to Ireland in the year 1996. Jill graduated with a Bachelor of Arts from the University College of Dublin. And she actually met her husband in Ireland so Jill met Tom Marr in Ireland and they actually ended up getting married in Ireland in 2008 and then they moved to Australia in 2009 and then Jill's family also followed them and moved back around the same time and Jill's family stayed in Perth whereas Tom and Jill moved to Melbourne, Australia. And Jill ended up getting a job at the ABC network. Tom described Jill as the funniest girl in the world. He said she was incredibly witty, intelligent, super smart, and that she brightened up any room she entered into. Jill's co-workers described her as independent, fun, she liked online shopping, and that she was super into like fitness and she was health conscious. And I remember at the time, like when we would watch the news and when they would show pictures and videos of Jill, like you really did get that vibe. You really got the vibe that she was like the sweetest girl, but that she was really fun. And I know that's weird to say, but that's really how we all felt, I think. So on Friday, September 21st, 2012, Jill went for after work drinks with her work colleagues and they went bar hopping and they first went to a bar called the Brunswick Green and then they moved on later on to a bar called Bar Etiquette and both of these bars were on Sydney Road in Brunswick and you know they were just having drinks together chatting you know doing what you do after a long work week and both of these bars that Jill went to were super close to where Jill and Tom lived they were literally like 800 meters away from their home so like a 10 minute walk. And while Jill was at these bars, she actually texted her husband, Tom, at around 9.47 p.m. And she was like, oh, join us, you know, come down to the bar, join us. We're just having drinks. But Tom had actually already returned home from having after work drinks with his work colleagues. And he had actually fallen asleep on the couch. So he didn't get this text message in time to go and join them. At around 1.30 a.m., the bar had closed and Jill was ending the night with her coworker. They were both like ready to go home and her coworker offered to like walk her home or drop her off in a taxi. But Jill was like, no, I live like two seconds away. Don't worry about it. I'm just gonna walk home. So her coworker gets into the taxi, goes home and Jill begins her walk home. During her walk home, Jill ends up calling her brother Michael on the phone and their father had actually had some health complications, so I guess they were just discussing their father's health. But then Michael said that Jill had really bad reception, so he was going to give her a call back right away. And he calls her back three times within the minute, but she doesn't answer any of those calls. So then later that night, around 2 a.m., Tom wakes up and he's like, oh, where's Jill? And he searches the house and he tried calling her multiple times, but she wouldn't answer the phone. So by 4 a.m., he had called her around 80 times and she didn't answer a single call. She didn't answer a single text, which was unlike Jill. So he ends up leaving their home and he starts walking around the Brunswick area looking for Jill. So he searches for her for around two hours and then around 6 a.m., he's like, you know what? I have to report her as missing. So he goes down to the police station and informs the police that my wife, Jill, is missing. So the police begin searching for Jill around her home area and around the bars that she visited. And they also put up missing posters in the city. 
And they determined that her phone was dead, so they couldn't trace her location and that also she hadn't used any of her bank cards. In the days that Jill went missing, her ABC colleagues, they used Twitter to help find Jill. And a Facebook page was also created that was called Find Jill Mar. And that was started on the 23rd of September. And five days after her disappearance, that Facebook page already reached like 100,000 likes. The public had become so aware of Jill Mar's disappearance, not only because of the constant media reports, but social media played a huge role in this. The public wanted to know, you know, where is Jill Mar and what happened to her? I actually remember this case so clearly. I remember I used to follow all the updates while I was at the gym, like during the six o'clock news. And I remember feeling so connected to this case because at the time, you know, around 18, 19, 20 years old, I used to go down to Sydney Road and go bar hopping and go to restaurants and go to hookah lounges. Sydney Road was like a super trendy place. Like it was kind of like where all the hipsters would go and it was always super busy. When I think about it, as soon as like the bars or restaurants closed you know, for the night, it would become super lonely. And I remember being there many nights, like with my group of friends and there was like no one else around us. Like there would be cars driving on the main road, but there was like nobody on the streets. You know, I was never alone. I was always either with my boyfriend, my husband now, or my brothers or my group of friends. Like I was never that type of person to just be alone. I was always with people. At the time, it was really scary to think that Jill went missing from a place that I had frequented so much. So on 24th September, three days after Jill's disappearance, Jill's handbag was found in a laneway right next to where she lived. And this laneway was already searched by the police two days prior. So they couldn't have missed a handbag of this size. So the police determined that this handbag was placed there on purpose to be found. Now at this point, Jill's husband, Tom, was like the main suspect because as most spouses are during missing persons cases. And watching Tom on the news, like I'm sure he went through a lot of interrogations and you could see his face during the TV appearances, like he was heartbroken. But Tom was super cooperative with the police and it must've been really hard for him because if it was me, I would've been like, hello, go find my wife, like stop looking at me. But I guess he knew the police were doing their job. And honestly, Tom just seems like a great guy who really loved his wife. So now back to Jill's handbag that was found. This was later determined to have been found by just a member of the public. This person was just a local shopkeeper who found Jill's handbag in the same laneway the day after Jill went missing. And they just took the handbag and kept it thinking nothing of it. They didn't report the bag or try to find the owner. They were just like, nice handbag. And they just kept it until their daughter called them and told them, you know, there's this lady, Jill Mar, who's missing. Everyone's trying to find her. And then at that point, the shopkeeper was probably like, oh shit. Then they decided to go back to that same laneway, put the bag back and just like creep away like nothing happened. And like, I totally get it. I probably would have freaked out too. Like, oh my God, did I do something wrong? Like what handbag? What, What handbag are you talking about? So the laneway was then sealed off and forensic testing began. And they also ended up finding a ABC pencil, which was from Jill's workplace, and two cigarette butts. That same day, the homicide squad actually took over this case because they found this area that was like flattened grass where it just looked like someone had been assaulted. So on 25th September 2012, CCTV footage was handed into the police by an employee of a boutique called the Duchess Boutique which was actually a bridal shop on Sydney Road. And this boutique handed in this footage that was recorded from a camera inside the store facing the road, like outside, because they believed that they may have caught Jill walking past on the cameras. So at 1.43 a.m., you can see a man, he's wearing a blue hoodie, and he's just kind of like lingering outside the boutique. And then you could see Jill approaching and then the man begins talking to Jill. And then prior to this at around 1.36 a.m., which is like five minutes after she leaves the bar, you can see that same man like running after Jill. And then he slows down and catches up with her, you know, like around the boutique area and just kind of like waits for her. And it is just so creepy. Like that footage just gives me the chills like every time. Like I am so aware of my surroundings. Like I remember someone told me, If you're walking alone day or night, don't ever listen with both headphones in and be unaware of like your surroundings. So like till this day, I'm like super aware. I'm just like, who is around me? Like I'm watching you, I'm watching you. So in this footage, you can see Jill super uncomfortable. She keeps looking around, she grabs her phone. 
And clearly she's trying to avoid like any interaction with him. Then you just see the both of them just like move off the camera frame. The CCTV footage was so clear that a detective watching this footage believed that maybe he could identify this man. So on 27th September 2012, six days after Jill's disappearance, police arrested a man named Adrian Ernest Bailey and they searched his home and car and found the blue hoodie, a shovel and a broken red SIM card that Adrian's girlfriend actually found in his pants while doing his laundry and she grabbed the SIM card and she like saved it in the laundry basket. So upon his arrest, the police actually questioned Adrian for 10 hours. And during this interview, Adrian is like super confident, denies everything until the police informs him about this red SIM card they found in his home. It was identified as Jill Mars. Adrian then says, okay, I want to get it off my chest. I fucked up, okay? He finally breaks down and confesses to raping and strangling Jill Mar with his bare hands. At 10 p.m. that same day, he leads police to where he buried Jill Mar's body, which was on Black Hill Road in Gisborne South, which is a 41-minute drive away from where he assaulted Jill in Brunswick. Jill's body was found six days after she disappeared. So this is what is believed to have happened on that night. On the night of Jill's disappearance, Adrian and his girlfriend actually attended a bar, but they ended up having an argument at the bar about Adrian being possessive and jealous, and his girlfriend pretends to go to the bathroom, but then she like sneaks out and goes and catches a cab back home. At 12.24 a.m., you can see Adrian on CCTV footage at that bar like he's on the phone and he's pacing back and forth and he seems agitated as he's calling his girlfriend like where are you but his girlfriend doesn't respond so he ends up going home changing into a blue hoodie and then he heads on down to Sydney Road in Brunswick which is known for being busy and full of young people especially during the weekend. So Adrian sees Jill he begins stalking her around 1 30 a.m. And he states that she actually looked distressed. So he was trying to help her by asking her, you know, if she's okay, if she needed any help. But when she flipped him off and threatened to call the police if he didn't leave her alone, he became agitated, dragged her into that laneway where her bag was found, raped her, and then strangled her to death. Jill was only 400 meters away from her home at that point. Neighbors around the area of that same laneway said they heard a female shout, get out of here. And they just believed that it was like a drunk couple, you know, having sex and they just didn't do anything about it. Adrian then leaves Jill's body in that same laneway, goes home to get a shovel and his car and returns around 4.22 a.m. He smashed her phone, threw away her belongings. He then put Jill's body in the trunk of his car, drove to Gisborne South and buried her body in a shallow grave on the side of the road. Adrian states that he was so upset and he was crying while digging this grave, but he then goes home, cleans his car internally and externally, details it, replaces all the tires on the car to destroy forensic evidence, then went home, slept till 1 p.m., got some food, watched some movies with his girlfriend, and just relaxed, you know, enjoyed his weekend. And then he was arrested six days later on 27th September 2012. So I mentioned earlier on that there was a lot of public outrage surrounding this case, so much so that on 30th September 2012, 30,000 people honored Jill Maher in a peaceful protest march down Sydney Road in Brunswick opposed to violence against women. The public were outraged at Adrian Bailey's past that had been exposed and how this crime could have just been prevented. Now, Adrian Bailey, he had a massive history of crime against women. Adrian Bailey was born on July 14th, 1971, and he was like a muscular guy who worked out in the gym and he loved martial arts. He claimed to be a Buddhist on his Facebook page. Okay. And he states that he had a violent father and that he was sexually abused by an older woman when he was younger. He was married twice and he had four children. And Adrian's violence started when he was only 19 years old. So let's dive into his crime, shall we? All right, so I'm going to read it here because it's a lot. So in June 1990, he held a teenage girl hostage in his home and he raped her. He was released on bail. In August 1990, he attacked a teenage girl walking home from the bus stop 
And in September 1990, he was released on bail. In December 1990, he assaulted a hitchhiker. And in June 1991, he pleaded guilty. He was sentenced to five years in jail and he was released after 22 months. Are we sensing a pattern? Yeah. In September 2000, he committed the first of six rapes of sex workers in the St. Kilda area where each woman was driven into a laneway and violently assaulted in his car. In April 2001, he was arrested on five out of the six attacks on those sex workers. He was sentenced to 11 years in jail and he faked his way through a sex offenders program in jail and then he was released in 2009 on parole. So while he was on parole in August 2011, he sucker punched a man, broke his jaw, pleaded guilty in February 2012, appealed the sentence and then was released on bail. And then his parole continued, even though this was a clear violation of his parole in the first place. And then in April 2012, he raped another victim in the St. Kilda area. In July 2012, he raped another victim after offering her a ride, because why not? He got away with it every other time. And then finally, in September 2012, he attacked and killed Jill Marr. This guy had committed over 22 rapes. He clearly had a problem, and the justice system seemed to believe that letting him out on bail and parole was appropriate, after every single repeat attack. Adrian was a serial offender and had such a violent past, yet he continually avoided going to jail on a long-term basis by appealing his prison terms. How could this happen? A person who is a known risk, you know, be given freedom that allows him to traumatize and attack countless women. Was it the fact that, you know, many of these assaults took place on sex workers? Are sex workers' lives just not considered to be valuable compared to other people's lives. The outrage in this case is that Jill Ma would still be alive today if Adrian was held accountable for all his crimes prior to Jill Ma's attack. Hey, you know, let alone after just the first couple of crimes, maybe hold him accountable after those. If he was serving appropriate prison terms and not constantly being let out on bail, this wouldn't have happened. Adrian himself has stated that he should have never been let out of jail and that he shouldn't have been given any more chances. He himself knew that he was never going to stop. This case really impacted the whole nation, especially because we felt, you know, that Jill Ma was just one of us. This could have happened to any one of us. On 5th April 2013, Adrian pleaded guilty to the indecent assault and death of Jill Mar. On 26 April 2013, he pleaded not guilty to a number of other assaults and sexual crimes on women dating back to the year 2000. On 19th June 2013, Adrian was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole for 35 years. Adrian tried to appeal this sentence. Why not? Give it one more shot but this was denied in less than 10 minutes. In 2015, Adrian was found guilty of three more assaults and his non-parole period was extended from 35 years to 43 years. So that means that Adrian Bailey will be eligible for parole in the year 2055 when he is 83 years old. And to be honest, that's still scary because if he keeps up his fitness in prison you just never know like 83 years old is not that old nowadays like people be staying fit by late june 2013 there was like substantial tightening of the state's parole laws which was a direct result of this case and many other cases where women were being attacked by parolees the laws now state that if parole is breached then penalties of up to three months in prison and a fine of over four thousand dollars will be implemented Plus, police can now send parolees back to prison if their breach, you know, was serious enough. Prisoners now will also need to prove that they are low-risk offenders before being granted parole. And there is now an electronic database as opposed to a paper one for managing parolees. The state premier at the time agreed that the system failed Jilmar and that they are aiming to make sure that this never happens again. Jill's husband, Tom Marr, 
spent many months challenging the parole board in the state of Victoria before its reform with the hopes of preventing a repeat of what happened to his wife. In August 2013, Tom Marr left Melbourne a broken man and he returned home to Ireland and he has since written a pretty powerful essay on the issue of violence against women, which I think is worth a read, so I will leave it linked down below. So that is the end of today's case, guys. This one really does still creep me out because Jill was so close to home and her life was taken so suddenly and without any thought. And to this day, I'm aware of my surroundings because of this case. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. I'm sure as women, many of us have had an encounter where we just didn't feel safe alone. So if you want to share your story in the comments, go ahead and leave it down below and I'll be sure to share one of mine. Oh my God, I could do a full story time on all the crazy encounters I've experienced with men. Like, anyway, thanks so much for watching guys. And if you haven't liked the video, please make sure to like it and hit the subscribe button. Please go ahead and do so. I would be so grateful. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys. Besitos. Bye.